Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And Cam, this is officially part two of everyone's festive treat. That's right. We have more bond for you, baby. Deck the halls and, and ring the bells. It does not end. Obviously, Christmas Day is in a couple of days' time, but we're giving you a second present to open early. And that is, of course, maybe the pinnacle of our interviews. We are speaking to the legendary, the man himself, director extraordinaire, and editor on this week's film, John Glenn. Yes, John Glenn, who um, got his start with the Bond franchise, um, editing and also doing second unit on Honor Majesties, and would go on to direct quite a handful of Bond films, starting with Free Your Eyes Only and ending with License to Kill. Yeah, absolute pleasure to speak with the man, and he was nothing but generous with his time. Uh, (laughs) It kind of blew our minds a little bit to be sitting on a Zoom call with John Glenn. Uh, I'm not sure I've still quite got over that. How about you? No, it was surreal because I'd watched a lot of um, behind the scenes documentaries on the Bond films over the years and seen so many clips of him talking about stories of shooting the various movies. And when he logged on to the Zoom call, it was kind of a, wow, like, how did this happen kind of moment. I was expecting just someone else called uh, John just to turn up and be like, ah, (laughs) that was it. It was the wrong guy. That makes sense. (laughs) He's like, yeah, I'm John Glenn. (laughs) It's the other guy. Yeah, the other guy. But uh, let's get down to it. It's the reason you're all here. Our second present to you all. Cam, roll the interview. And joining us now, it is none other than John Glenn. And may I say, it's an absolute thrill to have you on the podcast, sir. Pleasure. Um, Now, we usually have guests come on and talk about their whole filmographies. But yeah, this week we're working on On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is, uh, you know, it's just had its anniversary recently. One of my favorite Bond films and it's actually where you got your your start in Bond. So this is what we're focusing on today. We will trail off into other Bond films and questions down down the road in this chat. But that's what we're focusing on today. So the first question I have for you, John, is how did you get involved with Bond and on the Majesties? Well, Peter Hunt was directing his first um, James Bond film. And uh, I'd first met um, Peter Hunt, when we were both junior assistant editors at Shepherd and Studios working for Sir Alexander Corder. And um, he, Peter, advanced through the ranks, the editing ranks, and eventually became a very successful editor on the James Bond films. And uh, I rather lost contact with him for a few years, but unknown to me, he'd been watching my progress, same way that I been watching his progress and mine mainly was on tv films for television like danger man Mm -hmm. and um he got into a bit of a jam in switzerland on his big break to direct on the majesty's secret service and uh, the conditions were very bad there the snow conditions and what have you and he he was falling way behind schedule so he realized he had to have a a special unit to to uh, direct the uh, to make the Bond run, Bob run sequence. So he suddenly thought of me. And uh, I was um, a bit down on my luck at the time. And I was working at uh, Twickenham Studios on the Italian job. And I received a, a phone call in the dubbing theatre there. And uh, it was uh, Peter speaking from Pinewood. And he said, uh, he said, I might have an interesting job for you. Can you get over to see me? Well, Peter Collinson, who was earwigging this, he was the director of the Italian job. He said, oh, I know Harry Saltzman. I'll get on the phone and give you a big recommendation. I said, Peter, please don't don't spoil anything. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, he gave me permission to leave the Dummy Theatre and I went off to Pinewood, drove over there. And Peter was filming a scene with Diana Rigg and George Lazenby. And uh, I, I... just gave him a little wave. And when he finished the shot, he came over and he opened up the script and showed me the Bob Run sequence. And he said, uh, read that and tell me what you think. So I read the sequence and then he came back and I said, well, it's a fantastic opportunity, you know. And uh, he said, well, I, I've got to talk to Harry Saltzman and uh, Cubby Broccoli, he said, but I don't anticipate too much problem. And on the following Monday, there I was, flying first class to Switzerland to take over the second unit on the Bob Run sequence. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me. 
and uh, quite, came quite unexpected, as most of these things do. And uh, suddenly there I was, you know, from being quite despondent about my career at one moment, and next next minute I, there I was with a you know a really fantastic opportunity to show what I could do. I would love to know when you're walking into a situation like this. Bond is a pretty well-oiled machine. You know, they've made a few movies before this. It's a massive production. Does it feel very like welcoming and, you know, you have a good set, you know, sense of where to actually fit in here? Or was it kind of like walking into chaos and trying to make sense of it? Well, you discover very quickly, like the Bond films were like the biggest, most important films being made at that time. And they had the best technicians. I mean, the whole crew were the top cream of the pile, if you like. So, you know, you had a lot of help. You didn't have, you weren't on your own. It wasn't as though you were working on TV or, you know, working on a minor film. You had the, whatever you wanted, you got. Uh, so you didn't have any excuses about that. Uh, the logistics were fantastic. And uh, so I had every opportunity, you know, and I had a great crew. And I, what was interesting was I was, wasn't working with British uh, technicians. I was working usually with European guys who were all mountain people. They were all expert skiers. You know, the, the clapper boy was a wonderful skier. You know, every, uh, the whole camera crew were either German, Swiss uh, or Italian. And uh, because where we were filming, uh, you know, the, the borders are... That these countries border onto one another, and they're all up in the mountains. And absolute wonderful experience working with these people. Now, so you, obviously, you had a quick turnaround from agreeing to do this to heading off to Switzerland to actually shoot the second unit stuff with the bobsleigh sequence. What did you do to prepare in in those couple of days you had? Did you go back and rewatch some Bond films? You know, what did you do? No, I was very familiar with the Bond films. Obviously, I mean, I was a I was a fan, if you like, and right from Dr. No onwards. And I, I was really pleased that Peter Hunt had made such an impression as a film editor and he did a lot of second unit work as well. Um, so I was very pleased for him and I admired the films very much. And I admired the way that Peter um, formed a, a new kind of editing, you know, a sort of a short, a shortcut version of editing, you know, um, uh, Sean Connery would just look towards the door and next minute he, he was walking down the corridor. Um, it was quite unusual in those days. It was quite an advanced form of editing. And I embraced it very much in what I was doing. Um, and of course, you know, knowing Peter from all those years ago, we had a good relationship and we got on very well. And when, as soon as I arrived, he actually took the time out to take me down the Bob Run and show me all the various aspects of it and while we were doing that some kid came to barreling down the bob run in a in a little tiny little sledge and and burst into the middle of us fortunately he was okay but it he taught me a lesson i thought i've got to be very careful there's a huge safety aspect with these bobs because they travel at 70 miles an hour and they don't stop <laughs> you haven't got any well they have a break but it's not very effective uh, so you've got to, you know, first thing I learned was that I had to be very well of the security on the track because it was open to the public. And, uh, you know, you'll get kids go, trying to go down the Bob Run and uh, if our Bob comes tearing along at 60 or 70 miles an hour and they're in the run, there's nothing we can do to stop hitting them. So mm. uh, I immediately instituted a, a tight security on the run. Now, I would love to know, um, the Bond movies were known for their action sequences, and there's some phenomenal ones that happened before Honor Majesties, but this film in particular, it really feels next level, like you're seeing an evolution in Bond action, and something I don't think they maintained when you went to the next movie. Was there something going on, like a vibe or just direction even from Peter Hunt, when you're even doing that bobsled sequence that we're aiming for something maybe a little different than we'd usually do? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I wasn't a skier at that time. Later on, I became a reasonable skier. But uh, at that time, they used to I used, they used to carry me on a sledge or on their backs down the mountainside. I was the only non-skier on the unit. <laughs> um, but um, no, it was interesting because I, I had the 
use of a, a guy called Willy Bogner, mm -hmm. who was an Olympic skier, but he was also a, an amateur cinematographer. And uh, he used to, he had a, a specially adapted camera. It was an ha uh, with a Hasselblad viewfinder. So it was a big viewfinder. And he could ski backwards and forwards. He had points at both ends of his skis. And he hadn't been used on the film. And he came to me and he, he implored me to use him on the Bob Run. And uh, I said, you know, I was not suspicious of him, but, uh, you know, I, he, he wasn't a conventional cameraman at all. And uh, the English crew, the camera crew on there, were all sort of warning me about this chap. You know, <laughs> they were saying, you know, he's an amateur and you know, don't take too much notice of what he says. But I started to use him and he was fantastic. And uh, he was very brave. And uh, he, he, after we had, you know, we were actually running three, three bobsleds on the run at the same time. One was the camera bob and then there was the adversary. Uh, Bob run, uh, Bob sleigh, and then there was Bond's Bob sleigh. So we had three, and it was very difficult to to keep up, keep the distances you require when you film. Uh, so uh, Willie said to me, he said, look, if you tie me to the Bob with a cable, uh, say at 20 or 30 feet behind the, the Bob, uh, I'll, I'll keep absolutely perfect focus. And if I get into trouble, um, I'll not... I'll knock this uh, cable out of my battery belt and uh, I can escape by jumping out of the run. Anyway, I, I looked at him and I couldn't believe what he was saying, but in fact, it proved to be the best way to film the sequence. And we got absolute perfect focus every time. Uh, we had, did have a couple of little spills and that, um, we had to, uh, we lost a camera. Uh, Willie uh, dropped the camera at one point and we had to get a, a new, another one sent out from England which delayed us a little bit, but we didn't stop shooting. We were still operating uh, with the normal cameras, if you like. So generally, I mean, Willie was a big bonus on the film and I used him absolutely uh, a lot. He even, he even stood inside the Bob run and filmed the, the Bob going past him at 60 miles an hour. And uh, he said to me, he said, the centrifugal foot force being what it is, they'll, they'll always go up on the wall as they go around the corner. So I can, I can stand on the inside of the curve and get perfect shots every time. So it was very unusual filming, but uh, uh, it, it certainly worked. I think uh, health and safety would have had a blast with that if you'd done that now. <laughs> yeah. They, they wouldn't <laughs> no have health fans. and safety. <laughs> Um, yes. So this is the first film with George Lazenby and you're working with a very like young, very physical actor, which must have been interesting, especially as you're launching a new Bond for the first time post Connery. Did his sort of physicality as an actor feed into the way that some of the action was being shot to try to match it and also just to maybe enhance what we hadn't really seen before? Well, of course. Uh, George Lazenby, he was a very macho guy, you know, and uh, uh, he, he, was, he loved to, he, he wanted to get on skis. Now, he hadn't done much skiing. He hadn't done any skiing, as far as I know. And, of course, I, I'm on my first assignment, uh, you know, on a major film as second unit director. And the insurance costs on one of those movies is huge. If I broke George's leg or his arm or something, you know, I, I, my career would have ended there and then straight away. So my main job was to keep George off of skis. And of course, I'm working with all these world champion skiers and they're all, you know, trying to get friendly with uh, George and that and encouraging him to get on skis. And I'm trying <laughs> to discourage him from getting on skis. So that was one of my main jobs was to, was to keep uh, George safe um, because I knew very well that if he got injured, it would have terrible repercussions on the film. Right. And the sequence, the bobsled sequence is... I mean, definitely a standout within the film. But one thing I really admire about it is it never really loses track of character. You always have a good sense of the personalities of Bond and Blofeld throughout the sequence. And that's something that some action scenes in films struggle to when you have stunt doubles. Um, yeah. How do you maintain character in a sequence like that? 
Well, of course, we do the close shots of the actors in the studio, mostly. Uh, once once or twice, I was able to use them on the real location. Uh, Telly Savalas, for instance, you know, he, I, I, I had the use of him to do when he first arrives in the Bob Run. And uh, he slips down. And uh, when I told him what I wanted him to do, to, to actually jump into the run, uh, he looked at me and he said, where's my stump man? <laughs> So it was like, oh, okay, George, you know, um, Telly Savalis, he was, um, and George, they, they were great, but uh, Telly wasn't going to risk breaking his ankle or he, he wasn't going to do anything too energetic. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't a particularly young man at that time. So, um, you know, he, he did what uh, he did what I had to do, but uh, he, he did it very safely, shall we say. <laughs> he was no hero. <laughs> Um, so what is there any moments through the bobsled run that jump out to you as you know the most satisfying or the most difficult shot to pull off the one that you kind of you know everyone was kind of cheering when you actually achieved it well we the thing was that we I had a, a very good um, production manager with me a, a German chap and uh, he he was very very good a very good organizer and uh we arranged for to have two helicopters standing by, and as soon as the we done one uh, shot of the bobs in action, uh, they would pick up pick up the the bobs and and fly them back to the start of the run again. Uh, so this meant that we could actually do you know up to about twelve runs a day which is unheard of, you know, when you think three bobs on the run sometimes and two, mainly two bobs on the run. And uh, we were able to pick them up after each and, and do 12 takes a day. So that was, that was incredibly um, good for, for the schedule. You know, we could get through the stuff. And then I used Johnny Jordan, who was uh, from his helicopter, who had a special rig, which was photographing it from the air as well. And uh, I, I, we all had to wear white suits so we couldn't be seen from the helicopter <laughs> against the snow. But, uh, that, that, you know, it was a, a very successful operation. And uh, this time the snow, the weather had improved. Uh, when I first started shooting, the weather was terrible. Uh, snow, blizzards, what have you. And I, I put a, a, a sheet over the bob run and uh, I did close shots, close shots of the steering mechanism, close shot of the blades cut in the ice just by sweeping snow through the, through the shot to give the feeling of movement and, and jiggling the camera around. Um, and when that, my first material was shown to Saltzman and Broccoli or at, at Pinewood Studios, uh, someone in the audience said, well, what a waste of time. You know, we could have done that in the studio. And... Saltzman turned around and he said, look, he said, we've been sitting here for three months and it's not seen any material. At least this guy is shooting something. And uh, it, it, the great benefit of doing that is to keep the, the crew occupied. Because once they start playing football and what have you, you, you lose them. You know, they, they, they lose the will to live, if you like. And certainly... Uh, yeah, they were useful shots and we couldn't get enough of them. I mean, Peter Hunt kept saying to me, have you got any more shots of these close shots? Because if you look at that sequence, you'll see they use quite a bit. Bullets hitting the cowling and things like that. Things you can do in those conditions. Because there's no shortage of light. I mean, there's a huge amount of light up there in the, you know, even in a blizzard, the light is tremendous. You're still shooting F-11, you know. For sure. Um, now, you would go on and do second unit on Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. I would love to know, were there any lessons you picked up doing Honor Majesties that were very helpful going forward in the Bond franchise? Lots and lots of lessons. I mean, I was young enough to, be, to be, learn lessons quite easily. And uh, I was always very safety conscious. And uh, on Spy Who Loved Me, for instance, um, I went out to Canada and I shot the ski parachute jump uh, with Rick Sylvester, who was a, like a ski bum, an amateur guy. He showed me um, a film he'd shot in uh, 
Yosemite Park, where he went, he skied off of El Capitan, and uh, he it was like like a, 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 a sack of coal going off. It was there was no nothing James Bond about it at all. It was just a very <laughs> bad jump, and I, I could understand that. Uh, but he assured me that um, given the right conditions and the right crew, et cetera, et cetera, uh, that he could he could perform it gracefully as one would expect. And we sat out there for about three weeks waiting for the weather conditions. And eventually when I got a break, a two hour break where the sun was skating around the horizon, you can imagine that, that latitude. And um, when I actually filmed the shot, I waited for the doctor with the last helicopter brought the doctor in. And uh, when I said to Rick, don't forget, Rick, do it. And you don't forget your James Bond and do it with style and panache. And uh, he did. He performed beautifully. And because it was so late in, in the, 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 the day and the sun was skating around, if you look at that shot, the sun is actually spotlighting Bond as he goes down that slope. And I, if I had been a gambler, that's when I would have chosen to shoot it at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. Next, as soon as he had gone out of shot, the sun had disappeared. You know, it was quite an amazing piece of good fortune, as well as good planning. And uh, having shot that sequence, uh, of course, it went, went back. I uh, got it processed in Montreal. And uh, it wasn't put the perfect shot, uh, because at one point, one of the cameramen uh, hit the zoom lens because he thought we weren't going close enough. And he, there was a bit of a jiggle. But as I was shooting at uh, three times normal speed, 72 frames a second, um, the jiggle was, wasn't as violent as it would have been if I'd been shooting at 24 frames a second. So um, it, in fact, it makes it look more realistic, which it was real. Um, I mean, today you'd never do a shot like that. It would all be done in, uh, you know, with, with, in the computer. Mm -hmm. But um, that's real and it looks real. And the, the slight defect in it makes it even more real, if you follow me. <laughs> and uh, I came back to Pinewood and everyone was going crazy about this shot because it was the first shot that we'd done on the film on Spy Who Loved Me. And this was Cubby's first film on his own. Cubby Broccoli, that was the, he split with Harry Saltzman and now he was on his own. And he was thrilled to bits with it. And uh, in fact, they were so thrilled that he and the director of this girl, but they insisted that I went out and shot the chase that preceded it. And there again, I used my old friend, Willie Bogner, with his handheld camera. And I also used a very good Swiss camera and I'd used on the Majesties, uh, Alex Barbie. And uh, they were a great team. They didn't like each other particularly. In fact, I had to separate <laughs> them from fighting each other one day. We were, we were experienced with bad weather. And we were in the, in the top of the cable car station and uh, drinking coffee and brandy and what have you. And I said, we've got to shoot something. I said, let's, let's come on. We go, go up on the roof of the cable car station and we'll do an insert. And I went up there, and if you ever look at that sequence, you see the shot where the, where the, the rocket that Bond fires from his gun, where it hits uh, the, the heavy who's chasing him. That close shot of the, of the um, rocket going into his chest, we actually shot on top of the, the restaurant and the cable car station <laughs> when it was snowing. <laughs> but at that point, um, Alex and Willie had decided to have a fight and I had to separate them. You know, it's, I don't know, it's a, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Let's cruise for you. <laughs> well, I mean, we spoke a lot about the, the bobsleigh team, uh, bobsleigh sequence, I should say, and on Imagine Secret Service. And I think one of the reasons that stands out is not only from what you shot, but the way it's edited together, which is, funnily enough, another one of your jobs on the film, which is you were, of course, the film's yeah. editor as well. Um, when was that agreed? Because obviously they brought you on to be the second unit director. Did they then say, should we'd like you to edit it afterwards? Or was that during the well, filming? Yeah. Well, Pete, Peter Hunt, he said to me, I'd like you to go and edit the stuff you've been shooting for me, you know, put it together yourself. Um, so he, had, he already had an editor assigned to the picture. And uh, after he'd seen my stuff, um, he had a disagreement with 
the editor, whether it had something to do with the fact that I was there editing my stuff or not, and he got a bit upset, I don't know, but uh, he decided to leave. So then Peter turned around to me and he said, I'd like you to continue and, and edit the film. And, you know, Peter was a great editor. So, you know, it, it, it was um, a pleasure for me to work with him. And he, I mean, Peter Hunt defines the James Bond action style, um, starting right from Dr. No. I'm just really curious, what is the dynamic like in the editing room uh, when you have a director who is such an incredible editor? How much is it, you know, a collaboration between the two? How much is it you giving suggestions? How does that sort of dynamic play out? Well, we work quite separately. I mean, Peter took some of the dialogue scenes, you know, the scenes with uh, Diana Rigg and what have you, and he would edit those scenes and uh, he would hold court in in his cutting room. He'd, he'd, he'd always have lots of visitors coming in. So whereas I was in the next room doing the real work, if you like. Um, so we, we had a good good working relationship. We There was plenty of work for both of us. Uh, I concentrated mainly on my action stuff. And uh, he kept saying to me on the Bob run, he said, you know, the film's running at two hours, 40 minutes. We've got to sharpen it up. We've got to, you know, try and lose, try and lose some footage. And um, I, I really, on the Bob run sequence, I think at the very end, it was almost too tight sometimes. You know, we kept chipping away at it to try and reduce the length of it. Uh, but... Um, you know, it's it's one of those strange things with scripts and that you you never you try and time the script before you start shooting, and you try and time out how long it's going to be, but you never really know. And invariably, it turns out to be a lot longer than you anticipate. And we had some great stuff in that film, and it it took a lot of nerve sometimes to reduce scenes drastically. But um, you know, we did finish up when we first ran it for Cubby Broccoli. Cubby said, "How long is it?" and Peter lied through his teeth. He said, it's two hours, 20 minutes. I mean, I knew, I just sat there, I knew it was two hours, 40. <laughs> but <laughs> Cubby was no fool. We weren't, we weren't fooling him, I'm sure. But it did go out at two hours, 40. But uh, United Artists, when they ran it in America, they were losing one showing a day, you see, which is a huge amount of money. So they whipped 20, just took 20 minutes out of the picture. Mm -hmm. But subsequently, it was put back once it was sold to television and what have you. That footage went back. But uh, um, you know, they weren't going to lose out on a show in a day. Uh, it would have cost too much money. Um, the director, Steven Soderbergh, cites Honor Majesties as his favorite Bond film, but also a movie he goes back to over and over again when he's getting ready to direct his own films. And one thing he's noted is that it has a lot of the style of like French New Wave films in the filmmaking and one thing he really underlines is that when you look at the action sequences in honor majesties a lot of action films now have you know rapid cut action but what he notes with honor majesties is every shot is impeccable like every shot looks beautiful so even though you're cutting quickly you get a real sense of just the beauty of the moment and I would love to know if you could just talk about if this is something that maybe emerged from the fact that both you and Peter Hunter editors, like you understand not just the language of editing, but also, you know, you're both directors on your own right. Well, I carved out quite a, a decent career. I was editing and I was also um, doing a lot of second unit directing and editing on the same film, even before I became a director. Um, so... What, what happens on an action sequence is that you you break it down into small parts so that, uh, you, you know, you don't try and do it in one take, the whole thing. You know, you might have a scene that goes on for two and a half minutes, uh, but you break it down into three second segments. So you concentrate on those small pieces and you storyboard. So it's like comic cuts, really. And what you do is because you can't control the weather, uh, if you get a sunny day, you have to do your wide shots. If you get a day where it's snowing or raining, you do your close shots and your inserts. Uh, and the, the great thing is that you not only is it efficient from a scheduling point of view, but you, you keep the morale of the, of the crew up. You know, as I say, once they start to play football, 
you're in trouble. You lose them. <laughs> you know, it's you just have to keep them working. And uh, you can always find something to shoot. I mean, sometimes we even did scenes uh, without filming the camera just to to keep everyone busy. You know, <laughs> uh, and that shows in the films in a way because there's there's a, a crew, a busy crew, is a happy crew. And, uh, you know, you rely very much on all these people. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we had a very happy experience on, on Her Majesty's. Um, it was lovely up there, up in the mountains, and the weather was unpredictable. So you had to be, every morning I'd look out the window, you know, first light, and then the phone would ring and they'd say, oh, it's terrible, we can't fly today, we can't put the helicopters up today and all that. And I'd say, okay, well, uh, we'll meet at the so and so, and we'll do some do some close shots. <laughs> and we would we'd we'd just fritter away the day, just playing around with inserts, quite honestly. But everyone was kept busy. Mm -hmm. And when you were editing the film, you know, as Soderbergh noted, the French New Wave kind of feel. Was that something you were cognizant of? Um, were you looking at the films coming out of? France at that point and influenced by them? Well, I worked with a, a director called John Gilliman, who you may have heard of. Yep. Um, he, just, he went on to do some very good films. Um, and uh, when I first worked for him, it was at Nettlefold Studios in the 50s, I guess. And uh, he, he was um, an avant-garde filmmaker, and he used a lot of handheld hand -held camera work. And uh, he wasn't very popular with the, um, with the production people, with the, the producers and the, the owners of Metal Folds. And he was banned from the studio after he'd finished filming. So I was on the ed editing. The, I wasn't actually editing. I was an assistant editor on this particular film. And we used to let John up the fire escape into the cutting room so he could work with us and uh, be prepared to run if any of the bosses came round, you know. But we we uh, we kept um, we kept John happy, and John made his contribution, and could see what was going on with his film. And uh, for years afterwards, um, I remember on one of my films, uh, I was going to use Tanya Roberts as the leading lady, and uh, I rang John and asked him his opinion. He'd just done Queen of the Jungle with with her, and uh, he filled me in too. You know, he said she's very beautiful, but she's she has a um, she has a few problems, <laughs> shall we say? And he he marked my card, but we we went with her, and she was fine. But it was it was nice to be able to talk to him, and that. And of course, he, he did. He went on to be a very successful director. Right. Um, there's one sequence in Honor Majesties that I've always found really interesting. And it's the sequence where Bond is trying to escape from Blofeld's men, and he winds up at like the Winter Carnival. He runs into the bear that takes the photo. And this whole sequence feels like a psychological thriller moment. It really does have a different vibe than a lot of the other movie, uh, the, the other scenes in the movie. And I think it really stands out for that reason. If you could just talk a little bit about editing that sequence to kind of capture that sense of paranoia. Yeah, well, the whole scene was supposed to take place around the Christmas period. So there was a kind of a festival feel about um, about the atmosphere in Grindelwald where we were filming. And we flooded the car park there with water, which froze, of course, and that became our car park. Uh, sorry, it became our ice rink. And uh, so, uh, I mean, if you went to Grindelwald in the summer and that, there it is, a car park. But it, just imagine what it was like with us, where we, we were actually made a big festival there and we had all these people skating. It's where uh, Diana Rigg meets George Lazenby. Uh, there and uh, it's a lovely scene it's romantic and it's very colorful and uh, you know it was mainly uh, first unit shooting I must say I just did a few things in it but um, basically it was Peter Hunt's scene mm -hmm. and uh, it was a, it had a lovely atmosphere and it was genuinely a festival you know when you were there all the local people were there and not all of them being paid even, you know, they were just there because they're having a lot of fun. And it is very festive. And uh, it was a lovely atmosphere and the music helped a lot because we we played the um, the Christmas carol song that was specially written for the film. And uh, it just had a lovely feel to it. 
Was there a rhythm you were trying to hit when you're actually editing that sequence together? Yeah, I, I think a rhythm, rhythm kind of evolves. Uh, it depends on the material you have, you know. I mean, you don't actually cut it to music necessarily, but uh, you certainly add the music at some stage, and that helps you to to uh, time the shot sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we used to, when we edited the films, all my films, we, we put in temporary music uh, on the love scenes and the, some of the action scenes. We put temp music in and we get the best music. You know, we'll get stuff from Gone with the Wind and put that in, you know, just while we're editing. And uh, I remember John Barry saying, take that music out before I see the film because it would influence <laughs> him, you know. Uh, so we used to have to strip all the, the temp music out for John Barry. Uh, he did a fantastic score, by the way, on the Manchester's. Yeah, oh, definitely. One of his best. The, the, yeah, the Zither. Uh, he used this um, electronic music, which hadn't been used before that I know of. Probably it was in a few films, but uh, it had a very resonant bass rhythm to it. And uh, it was very unusual. And of course, then we we had Louis Armstrong singing that wonderful song. Oh, we yeah. have all the time in the world. Now, when you were in the editing room, I'm just wondering if there was any example you can think of that was like a creative solution you came up with just in the editing room that really worked in the movie, something that you kind of had to figure out. Well, when Bond gets slugged by one of the villains, um, Peter asked one of the assistants to... Um, get the film, get it frame cut. So, you know, in, in other words, we drop every other frame to make the thing go look as twice as, have the impact twice as fast as it really happened. Mm-hmm. But the, the assistant misunderstood him and he double printed each frame instead. So now you have that strange effect of a, which came purely by chance. <laughs> and uh, we saw it and, and it worked perfectly double frame in each one when he gets hit by this chap over the head, you know. So that was something that, that worked, which we hadn't really thought of. And uh, the mistake be- was eventually used in the film. Uh, there were lots of examples of that. I mean, it's very much a work in progress, you know, on a film. You, you try this and try that. And uh, it's the same with the, I mean, Ride of Love, my sound editor, you know, he, he was in charge of doing all the noise of the skiing, uh, the noise that the skis make, and uh, particularly on the bob run, the sound of the bob run. And uh, he finished up using a sort of a black plastic sheet and a scrubbing brush or a wire brush uh, to get that sound. And uh, it was all very experimental. But we all had fun doing it, you know. Now... You know, you've at this point you've edited the film. It's it's out there. Is there something looking back on on a Majesty Secret Service, a particular scene that you edited that you're particularly proud of? Maybe your favourite moment from the film. Well, I suppose it's the Bob Run sequence mainly, but um, there were other sequences I went on to do. I mean, there was the scene, with the chase, head him off at the pipe pass where uh, Blofeld is chasing uh, uh, Bond on his skis. And uh, we, we were, it was a night scene. Mm. Uh, so I, I had a word with the guys and uh, the electricians and what have you, and they couldn't really transport all the big lamps that we'd need. So we decided to use flares. So we put up these big poles with, um, with flares on the top, which are out of picture, but just used it to, to, to light the scene. And then, of course, the people who are pursuing him also carry flares. Mm-hmm. And that produced, that was quite unplanned initially. And uh, Peter was filming in Portugal at the time I was filming that. And uh, when he saw that stuff, he was very impressed with it. And uh, the scene where, um, where the, they, they're in, during the chase, he skis over that big um, uh, snow machine, snow clearing machine, which is a huge piece of equipment, very dangerous. So I had all these uh, skiers of mine all, all leaping over the top of this machine that was had these terrific blades churning up the snow. And uh, we found that if we just put red dye and all kinds of um, animal remains and stuff, anything going, 
But that was an interesting scene. And then we threw a line, uh, line over when all this red snow comes up, which is supposed to be blood because the guy falls into it. Um, we put the line over. He had a lot of guts. Yeah. And that was, that was, uh, that was fun. Yeah. So we did a lot of improvisation on the Bond films. And uh, very, very happy films to work on. Well, that leads me into my sort of my next question, actually. You know, you you gone on to do second unit on a few more Bond films. You then directed five Bond films. But looking back on, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's actually one of my top five Bond films. It's definitely had a reappraisal since it came out. I know it had a bit of a rocky reception with Lazenby and such in that, in that respect. But looking back on it now yourself, what does On Her Majesty's Secret Service mean to you? Well, it was my big break, really. Um, you know, I, it was I, it plucked me from obscurity into the big time, if you like. And uh, quite honestly, it was a wonderful opportunity. And I think I grabbed it with both hands, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wasn't a skier and I was working with all these skiers. Everyone, even the girl that used to bring the coffee down was on skis, you know. And so I was I was reliant on these chaps and they were very good. And uh, I sort of communicate very well with them, um, with the Europeans, if you like, you know, the, the Germans, the Swiss, the, uh, the Italians in that we, we had a very mixed crew and we worked absolutely fantastically well together. And there was no communication problems whatsoever because we all spoke the same language films. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> international. Uh, and uh, they all know which they're all trying to do a good job you know mm -hmm. so um no it's it's interesting because cubby broccoli always remembered i put him on the on the bob run he had a ride down the bob run one morning and uh <laughs> it was a four a four man bob and cubby as you probably know was a very big man so he occupied the two seats in the middle and there was Robert Zinnerman, who was uh, the Swiss bob champion, and Heinz Loy, who was in the steering. And they went down in one of the fastest runs of the day. And Cubby just never, he just loved it. He, he, he just, you know, when they went around cur the stone curve, all, the, all your blood goes down into your ankles, you know, you're going around there with the centrifugal force. And he never forgot that. And he loved it. And when Lewis Gilbert, um, got the gig to, to shoot Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, the first thing he said to Cubby, uh, Cubby said to Lewis, he said, you've got to find a job for John to do on the, on the directing. I was going to edit the film anyway, but uh, he said, you've got to get him to direct something. That's how I came to do the uh, ski parachute jump. First shot of the film. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have sort of a grab bag of questions just about some of the Bond films you directed. It's, it's so much to go through. So I just wanted to pick out some questions that maybe people haven't asked you many times. Um, one, just to kick it off, um, when it came to For Your Eyes Only, um, it opens with a shot of Bond at Teresa's grave and you work on Honor Majesties. We also touch on T Teresa Bond in License to Kill. This is not an era where the Bond franchise is really trying to embrace continuity like it is now. Was it, you know, something that you were pushing for? Because it's very rare to have these sort of, you know, repeated um, concepts popping up movie to movie. Well, I used to, I used to design the uh, pre-title sequences, you know, and sometimes they had nothing to do with the movie at all, you know, that, that was going to follow. And on For Your Eyes Only, my instru first instructions from Cubby Broccoli was to find another Bond. He thought that um, Roger was getting too old and it was costing too much and what have you. So I was told to find a new Bond. So that's how we came to do that. I came to work at that um, graveyard scene out to, re to remind the audience about the history of Bond, uh, of Teresa. And then, of course, the helicopter comes and picks him up and then it's um it's run by remote control and how that happened was i was walking around the studio one sunday with cubby and one of the carpenters there had his brought his boy in on a sunday and uh, the kid was running around with what was then a very new toy which was a remote control controlled car and we both stopped as the as the car ran into us and that's what gave me the idea for the remote controlled helicopter <laughs> So I developed that sequence with that from that little, just that little incident, you know. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have a question for my sister. Octopussy is her favorite movie of all time, not James Bond, movie period. One she's revisited over and over again. And she had a question for you. Um, she says, Octopussy features a lot of women in spandex jumpsuits and sexier outfits, but the characters themselves were very strong and independent. The movie presents these women as empowered and not to be objectified like some of the other Bond films did. How were you able to film and capture the strength of these women instead of having them presented as Bond sex objects? Well, I suppose it all goes back to when you select these girls and they come into the, a lot of them were models, um, uh, had been models sometimes, and, and uh, they, were, they were coming from all sorts of, of directions. And uh, we needed about, I think we needed about 20 girls in that film. So they would come in the office and it would be very enjoyable. You know, they'd come and we'd, we'd have a chat with them and I'd give them a cup of coffee and... And it was all very informal. And what we were looking for was character from these girls. Obviously good looks, but also character and also athletic ability. Um, uh, there was an awful lot of circus stuff in that film and uh, we needed acrobats. So sometimes we, we got acrobats in as well. Mm -hmm. um, we got, had a whole mishmash of, of girls uh, even the love boat scene at the end of the film is where, you know, you see all these girls rowing the, the love boat with Roger Moore and, uh, you know, making love in the back of the, uh, of the boat um, with a broken leg up in a, some sort of truss. And the girls outside are rowing and uh, we're saying in, out. In out at the same time that Bond is making love with the, with <laughs> the leading lady, so it was very funny, um, very funny scene. But uh, you know, all through that film, we had a wonderful bunch of girls, probably the best we ever had in, in uh, assembled in one in one movie, and they were all great personalities, and uh, they kind of you know, working together, uh, there was a bit of competition from them, you know, which is always a good thing. Uh, they were sort of competing against one another in a, in a way, and that, that got the best out of them. Do you think also having Maude Adams as the centre really helped in that regard? Because, like, she brings so much sophistication to that character that maybe it raised the game of everyone around her. Yeah, she was lovely, Maude, no doubt about it, it still is. And um, I remember on the set one day at Octopus, she, she brought her mother in, and her mother was in her 70s. And she introduced me to her mother, and I looked at Maud, and I said, I can see, Maud, where you get your good looks from. <laughs> and her mother was, look, was looking fantastic at 72 or whatever it was, and, uh, and Maud is aging very well as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, no, they're, they're, they're great girls, and... Uh, Maud, of course, she's the only one that's actually appeared in two, two Bond movies, mm -hmm. starred in two Bond movies, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of strong women, I have a question as well about View to a Kill. That was the Bond film I saw first that made me fall in love with the franchise. But now I look at that movie and I see that you're shooting scenes with Grace Jones and Christopher Walken. And the dynamic between the two of them is combustible in the movie. I would just love to know about working with those two actors, very unique individuals on set and finding that sort of chemistry. Yeah, well, Grace was wonderful. I mean, uh, she she was, uh, she's just a big personality. And uh, she and Roger had a bit of a set too one day where she was, she liked to play this very loud music because she was not more known as a, as a musician, you know, as, a, as mm -hmm. a singer, if you like, than she was as an actress. And uh, she used to play this very loud music, and she was in the next dressing room to Roger Moore. Mm -hmm. And Roger got so fed up with this music that he, he went in and he gra grabbed hold of this ghetto player she was using, and uh, she was he was trying to smash it, and she was fighting with him. And this went on for about 10 minutes in the corridor. It was very amusing. But they had a good relationship, really. It's just that they were, you know, I think that um, Grace, I remember when we finished shooting, she said to me, she said, oh, John, she said, what am I going to do now? The film's ended because we all become a kind of a family. You know, we shoot for six months on a movie 
and you become really attached to these people. It's just like having a family. And of course, it, you finish shooting and it all ends and they all go off in their different directions. And, uh, and uh, that's the end of it. And it's quite sad in some ways. And Grace was in tears, you know, and she said goodbye, you know. It was, but, uh, I mean, I saw her, I've seen her from time to time since then, of course. And uh, I think she even plays at the Henley, the Henley Festival here where I live. Uh, she played one year, but uh, no, they're, they're wonderful people, wonderful crew on that film. And, and Christopher Walken, of course, is a fabulous actor. He was very offbeat uh, when we were <laughs> filming in Shanti. Uh, uh, I, he had a habit of wandering off. And uh, so I got the junior assistant director and I said, look, here's a radio. Don't let Christopher Walken out of your sight because whenever we need him we need him you know we don't want to have to go looking through the woods to find him and of course this christopher watching this boy and the moment the poor boy turned his eyes the other way christopher was gone <laughs> and he the poor kid got told off because he'd lost christopher but uh, we got him back but he was a great great fun to work with very very nice man and I had a question about, um, you know, we are seeing the last Daniel Craig film. I see it tonight at the time we're recording this. And they're going to be launching a new Bond in a couple of years. You launched a new Bond when you brought Timothy Dalton in for The Living Daylights. What sort of, you know, lessons did you learn about launching, not just Timothy Dalton, but you were there for the launch of George Lazenby as well, that you think is something that really is important when it comes to sort of that initial Bond entry, the one that's going to, you know, introduce the yeah. viewers? Yeah, you have to devise a novel way of introducing him. I, I think Peter Hunt did with uh, on the Majesty's Secret Service. You know, you had a, a whole series of inserts of lighters being flicked and cigarettes being lit and whatever, and then slowly revealed him in that fight sequence on the beach. Um, that was, I think there was a line, something about the other fella, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll be the same with uh, with the new Bond whenever they decide to do it. Uh, it might be a gap of two or three years before they do it. I don't know. But uh, I think the public, public will be ready for it. And I can imagine <clears throat> I can imagine a line coming from M, something like, uh, you've got big boots to fill, you know, referring back to Daniel Craig, I suppose. <laughs> He's been very successful, let's face it. But, uh, I mean, all the Bonds have been successful, except for G George, poor old George, um, and he did the one. And he likes to say now he turned down the chance to do a second one. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> but uh, he turned up. But he, he t One day we were at the music session. And um, this figure came in, and I thought so it was a tramp who had come off the streets, you know. I was in the music. We were recording the music. And uh, this figure came in. He kept looking at me and grinning, and he had this big, full beard. I didn't recognize him. It was George. And he said to me, he said, John, you don't recognize me, do you? And I said, God, George, no, I don't. Well, Cubby wasn't very happy about it, introducing a new Bond, and he comes up looking like as though he'd been sleeping rough, you know. That's not what uh, Bond's all about, is it? <laughs> so he, he, he didn't endear himself to Cubby and turned up at the premiere with this beard as well. It wasn't quite the image that Cubby had in mind. But uh, that's George. He's, he's that sort of character. But, you know, speaking of legacy, we, we briefly mentioned No Time to Die, which of the three of us, only I have seen right now. So no spoilers are in this chat. But, I, you know, I will say it makes several nods towards On Her Majesty's Secret Service. And I think that's, that goes to stand for the fact that it's such an influential film. It might have been necessarily successful in some ways at its time with George, but I think it's gone on to influence the franchise ever since. And I think that's a lot to do with your editing and, and your directing in the film. So I think that's what's brought us to this conversation. We can only thank you for... For, for doing that and bringing us years of enjoyment. That's very kind of you to say that. I think it's also fair to say it was probably one of the best books mm -hmm. on the Magisters. You know, it had everything in it. it a lot of, uh, lot of heart, shall we say. You know, the fact that 
that Bond gets married uh, and briefly. I mean, his bride is killed within hours of the marriage. You know, it's uh, it's, a, it's a tragic sort of thing. You know, really. And um, but it was a very very good book. And the setting, we I don't think we could afford to shoot that now. Uh, you know, in Switzerland, I think it mm. was. You know, it was I think ten Swiss francs to the pound at that time. Now it's about one, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> so you know, the cost of filming in those beautiful mountains in Switzerland is astronomical now. So uh, I think we we did it at the right time. As someone who worked on Honor Majesties, did you find it at all frustrating when the follow-up film Diamonds Are Forever came around and really didn't do anything to continue the storytelling of Honor Majesties? Not really. I don't think there's a, I mean, I think, you know, you you had the Fleming books at that time. I mean, now, of course, we don't have the, the books. We have the characters, but we don't have the books. And um, it's, a, it's a sad loss because um, in today's world, it's a struggle to find um, to you can you know to find a great villain. Uh, in our day, uh, the stories were a lot simpler. You know, they weren't dealing with um, computers and stuff. I mean, all 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 my films were done for real. All the stunts were done for real, um, and we had to be ingenious. Um, now it's uh, oh, don't do that. Uh, we will do that in in post. You know, and. I think I think the films are missing something by it, you know, because when you do real stunts, somehow that you know they're real. I mean, explosions, for instance, you know, they they don't look real half the time now. And uh, I, th I think the public are pretty sophisticated. I, I think they see the difference. Mm -hmm. Now that you know this is Daniel Craig's last film, and we're going to pivot off one way or another where would you like to see them go there's been talks of them going back and starting the books again and then going back to maybe the 50s and 60s and then there's talks of you know recasting different, different genders and things like that where would you like to see the bond franchise go post daniel craig i think they i think i'd like to see them go a bit simpler you know Let's go back to real things Mm -hmm. um, less of the sophisticated gadgetry you're getting now, you know, the, the, the reliance on computers. Um, I, it's maybe my age, you know, the fact that I'm not particularly computer literate. I mean, I'm my wife is, fortunately. <laughs> oh. uh, although she might disagree with me. But, um, you know, it's funny how the films change because I, I remember when, uh, with Roger Moore, I remember talking to Michael Wilson about it. And, uh, you know, I, I said to Michael at the time, I said, Michael's got such a wonderful personality. It's like, it's like um, you know, he, he's wonderful. Kids love him and everyone loves him. You know, he's, and it's very difficult to make him out to be a killer. Um, Sean Connery, you could believe he could kill someone, you know what I mean? But I don't think anyone could ever believe Roger Moore could kill anyone. <laughs> In fact, my wife said the other day that, yeah, he tickled them to death. <laughs> but so we had to tailor, we had to tailor those films um, to, to take into account the actor's personality. And uh, I mean, some people might argue that, that Daniel Craig's a bit glum. You know, there's not that much humour. Um, in my films, it was all human because that's what we were working with. We were working with Roger mainly. <laughs> and uh, it was a laugh a minute. You know, he's, he's just such a funny man. And uh, he's a good actor, a very good actor. But uh, he doesn't, he never thought of himself as being a good actor, Roger. I keep reassuring him. I just have to say, <laughs> you can do it, Roger. You can do it. <laughs> Well, I, I'm very conscious of your time. So we have a quick fire round of questions we always do at the end of our interview. So I'll, I'll throw that to you now before we wrap up, John. Beyond Bond, what is, you know, because we're a spy movie podcast. We tackle not just Bond, but spy movies in general. What is your favourite yeah. spy movie? Um, well, I suppose I, I love the, uh, the end Indiana Jones films. I thought that Spielberg was muted at one time. He said that he would love to have done a James Bond film. I don't think we could have afforded him, quite honestly, but <laughs> he, he said that. So what did he do? He went and did his Indiana Jones films, which are really like James Bond films in his own way. 
again, used in a lot of humor. Uh, so I used to like those films very much. Um, the other spy films, um, I was trying to think of the one uh, with uh, Schwarzenegger where he was, um, he was a spy, but his wife didn't know it. True, right. True Lies. Yeah. Yeah. True, True Lies. lies. I like that very much, yeah. Uh, Cameron's a very good director. And uh, yeah, I, th I think that uh, there's been lots of good spy films, even some of the Hitchcock films from years ago, you know, Foreign Correspondent and all this mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, what I loved about Hitchcock was his humour. He always managed to put humour into the film. I think it was in Foreign, Con Foreign Correspondent where he had a rather mundane car chase, like three cars chasing each other through a village. And uh, how he took the curse off of it was he had a drunk come out of a, a pub and uh, go to step in the road. And the first car comes through and the guy steps back. Then he goes out to step on the road again. And then the second car comes back. And by the time the third car comes through, the guy turns around and goes back in the pub, <laughs> which I just thought was absolutely a fantastic stroke of comedy, you know, and something he, he obviously improvised to to a large extent, because it was such a corny situation, you know. And I think you can take a, a situation on a film where you think, oh, this is awful, you know, what can I do to lighten it up? Um, I, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun on the, on the bonds with humour, I must say. I mean, I think on uh, Octopussy, it's one of my favourite films as well, but I really did take a chance on that, I really... I mean, it's, at times it's a bit like the Keystone Cops, you know, <laughs> the railway, tr the train, uh, where the car, the Mercedes gets its uh, tyres shot off and it finishes up on the railway track, you know. Uh, I'm sure Covey's eyebrows went up a bit when he, uh, when he saw that happen. <laughs> but it worked, you know. You may have it just worked uh... with Roger Moore. It wouldn't work with Dan Craig, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just reinforces what I'm saying, that, you know, it works with Roger, but it wouldn't work with Daniel Craig. You know, it's mm. just, it's one of those things, isn't it? You you have to tailor the action and the, the film to suit the actor that's playing the part. I don't think you have to be the greatest actor in the world to play James Bond, quite honestly, but you got you have to have a sense of fun and the twinkle, you know. Mel Gibson would have made a fantastic Bond, I always thought. Mm -hmm. It's, it's nice to know I'm still in with a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I still have hair, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't think the world's ready for a bald bond. Well, Sean did all right without too much hair, didn't he? <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I suppose that leads me on to my last question then. Um, in terms of Bond films, what is your favourite Bond film? Could be one you've, you've directed or, or edited or, or any of them, really. I think Goldfinger was my favourite Bond film. You know, I mean, Modesty precludes me from mentioning my films really but <laughs> I, no, I think Goldfinger was the one that the book I loved mm. and Guy Hamilton who was a friend I knew him very well uh, Guy was a very good director and uh, he also was a very nice person he was a bit of a war hero as well you know he was in he had quite a, a war service he spoke, spoke absolute fluent French as he was brought up in Paris Mm. And uh, and it, it, we had Janine and I had a wonderful dinner with him in France, um, running a film, and we had dinner afterwards. And uh, he told us some of his exploits in the Second World War. An amazing man. And he used it. He used some of the things uh, that they used to do. I mean, he was on special ops. You know, where they used to run agents into into France, and uh, he got stranded there. Guy, he got, he got the boat. Boat had to leave suddenly, and poor old guy was left in France for about a month, <laughs> living down a cellar. And uh, after a while, the, the, they felt sorry for him. The, the farmer that was hiding him, and he took him down to the local um, local pub, and it was full of German soldiers. And the, the stupid waitress there shouted out, "Where you, you're not from round here?" <laughs> Was it a different accent? <laughs> so he was quite a character, but he, sadly he's gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all I can say is is thank you 
for taking the time to speak to us today. It's it's not often you get to speak to your heroes, so I, I can only say thank you for your time, John. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pleasure. It's nice talking to you. Some nice questions. So okay. yeah, John, thank you so much for joining us. As a I pleasure. said, you know, you've uh, right. you've brought light to to a film, and this is our Christmas movie as well. So we're glad you could join us for a Christmas, oh, special nice. Christmas treat. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I mean, I just want to say, like, the three movies that made me love James Bond were Octopussy, For Your Eyes Only, and The Spy Who Loved Me. So you had a real stamp just on my entire life, really. And <laughs> I'm still, I still love Bond, and it's those three that were the ones I watched over and over and over again as a you know, young think, person all the way to now? I think it depends really on your age when you're introduced to Bond for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, they have such an impact on you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I remember on one occasion, um, uh, a friend of mine went to see, uh, I think it was Octopussy, and uh, where, the, where the squid thing comes out of the, the, during the fight, clamps itself on the guy's face. He said his son, who was with him, hid under the under the chair because it was so frightening. And he said, saw me and he said, I was cursing you, he said, because my boy then said, insisted on me taking him back a second time to the cinema so that he could keep his eyes open when this uh, when this uh, the uh, the octopus clamped on the onto the onto the baddest face. And he said he had to see it three times in all. I said, Well, it was good for business. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, John, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Pleasure. Well, there you go, folks. That was our chat with John Glenn. As I said in the intro, I'm still genuinely surprised it even happened. Yeah, no kidding. It's a Christmas miracle indeed. And I was riveted to hear him talk about, you know, so many of the interviews with John Glenn, they're talking about, you know, directing Octopussy, for example, or, um, you know, kicking off the Dalton era with uh, The Living Daylights. But it's very rare that we spend a lot of time, you know, with him actually talking about shooting the bobsled sequence on Honor Majesties and editing that film. So often when people talk about John Glenn and the Bond franchise, it's more of a postscript of, oh yeah, he started out as an editor, but then he became a director, and let's talk about those movies. I thought it was so much fun to do kind of a deep dive on his beginnings. Absolutely. And, you know, we didn't talk about this in the intro, but really what we were trying to do with this chat is to focus on, on Her Majesty's. And we said we, we pitched it to him as such because, you know, there's lots of great interviews with John Glenn out there. I mean, I could recommend a really 007's recent interview with him at the beginning of last year. Uh, they spent about the same amount of time, but they really covered the scope of his work, whereas we really nailed down on Her Majesty's. But so, yeah, I mean, Cam, what were some of your highlights from the chat? I mean, just hearing him talk about the technical aspects of doing the bobsled chase was riveting to me because it's something you notice. We've talked to a few directors now, and they all have different approaches to talk about their craft. And while John Glenn wasn't a you know primary director on Honor Majesties, just the way he tackles his approach to filmmaking is very technical. And just his ability to break down the process of putting together what is, I think, you know, one of the most phenomenal Bond action scenes of all time was just really interesting to me. You're, of course, talking about the uh, gondola in Venice, right? Obviously, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, it was um, interesting to hear the mechanics how that go into this sort of thing, how these, these shots are put together. Um, it's not something I thought I would get out of it, this interview, but um, really interesting insight. And I think this is the sort of information that people that are looking at, at filmmaking should really be learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just his sort of explanation as to um, how to find sort of the rhythm of a moment. I liked when he was talking about that whole sequence that I love with the cackling bear photographer and that mm -hmm. whole Christmas carnival and how he's sort of looking to strike a vibe with the music that's playing. I mean... It's one of those things, though, where when you listen sometimes to someone like a John Glenn explain these moments, the magic is on the screen, but it's kind of like trying to explain the technical aspects. There's like a there's a divorce there that you can't quite ever connect because the person that made the movie is like, yes, here's how he did it. But ultimately, like something between what they were doing on a technical you know, uh, aspect versus the transition onto the big screen, it's like they created magic. And it's like, I don't even know if anyone really knows how they ever do it. No, absolutely. And when we started the show, the whole idea was I was a complete novice when it comes to filmmaking and being a critic. I'm still a complete idiot, but that hasn't changed. And I'm slowly learning, you know, how this stuff works. So for me, this is a this is film school almost. 
and it's really interesting just to see that 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 aspect of it. I know you know a wee bit more, but then yeah, there's this the disconnect sometimes. Like I watch a film, and I know something works or it doesn't work. I can't tell you how. I can't tell you why. Sometimes you're a bit better at that. You've got more words in your vocabulary than I do, so you sound smarter most of the time. But um, just to hear John break it down, it actually just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you know, so often with these Bond films, there's like a real mystique about what goes on behind the scenes on Bond films. They all, you know, kind of have this magic about them that I think us as Bond fans really appreciate. But I really do appreciate these inside looks where we get to hear people talk about the nuts and bolts about making a sequence. And just the fact that, like, you know, when he's in the editing room putting together this movie, how they're just finding, like, solutions by accident. And somehow, when you see the movie, it's, like, incredible. But in the moment, they're probably looking at the footage going, like, Ah, oh, crap. How do we connect these two things? Uh, I don't know. Any ideas? Let's let's try something. Yeah, people don't even really think about editing as a... You see the name on the screen in the, in the credits, but someone dumps off a whole reel of film and they tell you to make a movie out of it. That's, that's quite the task. And I imagine what was actually filmed for a lot of those sequences, like the bobsleigh scene, for instance, was hours extra footage condensed into a, a five-minute action sequence. Yeah. And that takes a hell of a lot of craft. It does. And I'm always interested when I hear editors talk about filmmaking because they would know after all of their various uh, work experiences about battling with footage in the editing room. And, oh, man, I wish I had this shot because then I could make this happen. And so it's interesting to hear someone who would go on to become a director. And you get the sense just hearing him talk about the bobsled that there's a reason whether you you know care for the movies he directed or didn't, they're very well made on a technical level like they really do hold together just on a coherent level in terms of visuals and i would imagine it's from experiences like this you know starting out as an editor and knowing exactly what you need to shoot to make a movie that's really going to play coherently to an audience and that's i think why you find a lot of people who started off as editors or writers for instance go on to make quite good directors because they know the building blocks of the story or the building blocks of the sequence they had to do it themselves so then they can translate that into what is the vision on the screen. Um, I think of Shane Black, for instance, as a guy who did the same thing. Um, but we did, of course, touch on John Glenn's other Bond films. We did have, we saved like one or two questions each at the end, because yeah, you can't let uh, a chance to talk to someone about Christopher Walken <laughs> in a view to a kill just slip by, you know. My favorite anecdote, perhaps, of this entire interview is how they couldn't pinned down Christopher Walken and he kept disappearing. That to me is an incredible little nugget of information there that seems so truthful. <laughs> I, I can just see him like, I don't know, riding a horse somewhere. Cause he is of course at home. In the saddle. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I, I, that, that, the idea of maybe he's like hiding in a bathroom cause he doesn't want to do the scene or something. That's just, that's so Hollywood. It's just disappearing into the woods. That to yeah. me is incredible. Like, just the idea that someone had babysitting duty for Christopher Walken <laughs> is so perfect a Hollywood story that it's incredible. And just hearing him talk about, you know, the sort of grab bag of questions on, you know, his other work and the whole, you know, nod to Teresa Bond at the start of For Your Eyes Only. And, you know, things like that were really interesting to me because when you look at John Glenn's work, he's... I think really the only guy connected to these repeated mentions of Tracy. Um, I think there might have been one actually in the Brosnan era, but you look at For Your Eyes Only, you've got The Grave, and then in License to Kill, there is sort of an acknowledgement that Bond was married in the past and something bad happened. And um, I like that he was sort of working in these little continuity nods here and there um, at a time when you just did not do that. I mean, look at, uh, you know, Diamonds Are Forever, which followed this movie, for God's sakes, which he had nothing to do with. Did that have any continuity in it? Not really. You could like infer at the start of the movie that Bond is mad about the death of Treza and hunting down Blofeld, but it could easily be him just chasing him after, you know, you only live twice. Like there's no mention of a wife. Yeah, it's a fair point. I hadn't really considered that, but I think we will be considering that very soon. Yeah, not too far off for sure. But, you know, just to, to bring it home. I'm so glad we got the chance to speak to John Glenn. He has helped shape some of the most important pieces of cinema to both of our lives i mean we we have a spy movie podcast we're not talking about james bond every week but we start this over our love of james bond 
And the man is responsible for a handful of them. And I think, has he got the most directing credits of any? Yeah. Any, on all of Bond? He does, yeah. And, you know, he's one of the few voices we have for that classic Bond era in terms of behind the scenes personnel. Um, but he wouldn't become a director till later on, but just doing second unit and editing on Honor Majesties. There's not a lot of people, you know, who worked on those 60s Bond films that we're even able to talk about. So to have his insights is invaluable. Absolutely. But, um, I mean, what a way to to almost finish 2021. That's right. That's right. Because we have another interview landing next week with Yvonne Zima, who played Gina Davis's daughter in The Long Kiss Goodnight, a film that has really grown into a cult favorite and one I think a lot of action fans are watching this time of year. Absolutely. I mean, we've only identified two spy Christmas films, one being on Her Majesty's and the second being The Long Kiss Goodnight, although... We are putting it together a couple of follow-up ones that will take us through the next few Christmases, so don't worry about that. But um, just a chance to speak to... We haven't spoken to an actor in a long time, actually. Quite a while, yeah. Again, Yvonne was very generous with her time. So once you're finished with Christmas dinner, you're full of chocolates, just sit back next Tuesday and listen to the interview, and then we'll be joining you back with a normal episode in 2022. That's right. So your mission, of course, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week and listen to the Yvonne Zimmer interview. And also check out Long Kiss Goodnight if you haven't seen it. It's a film we both enjoyed watching. It didn't quite make the knock list for us, but it was a close one for sure. And I enjoyed the hell out of the rewatch for the interview. So it is a movie that's a lot of fun. Absolutely. And again, thank you to John Glenn. And do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, he had a lot of guts. <laughs>